is on. As indie publishers, we know how to solve problems and work with technology and all kinds of things like that. So, ah, And another thing, if you're an author or publisher of any kind, you should always know to get things done on time when you say they're going to be done. So it's one... There are so many things that as I started, because I lived through all this, and I started going through, but that came from left field, but that changed that thing over there, and that made that thing happen. And as I started putting all this stuff together, um, so Craig and Michael flew me and my wife Rebecca out to Bali for the 20 Books Bali conference. And they said, oh, well, you just have to do a couple of talks for a free trip to Bali, which in my mind means this better be a pretty kick-ass presentation if I'm going to do it. So I put all this together for um, 20 books in Bali. And this is just a picture up here. This is part of our publishing house. I'm, oh, I'm Kevin J. Anderson. I've written 178 books. I'm traditionally and indie published. Um, I've got 24 million copies of my books in print in 34 languages. I've written for Star Wars and X-Files and Batman and Superman, and there's a minor movie out now called Dune that I worked on. Um, lots of stuff, but I also, my wife and I founded Wordfire Press in about 2010, and we have since released about 480 titles from 125 authors. Um, I got hired... I'm also the director of the graduate student program, a master's degree program at Western Colorado University for a master's degree in publishing. They hired me, and as far as I know, I'm the only program, well, in the country, probably in the world, that gives equal rate weight to indie publishing and traditional publishing for the program. Um, I have postcards up here if anybody wants to learn more about it. And I get to say this at 20 Books, even though you're not supposed to promote, because Craig Martell gives us a 20 Books scholarship every year. So um, it's connected. Anyway, so right up there, that is our, our assistant publisher, Percival. And those books are uh, a limited edition hardcover that I did. Uh, we'll talk about it in a little bit. But that's a book called Drum Beats. It's a novel that I wrote with uh, Neil Peart, the drummer from Rush. And we wanted a real fancy first uh, or illustrated hardcover edition. And so we did all that start to finish and sold it. Um, we sold 800 copies. We sold out in, in days. And Dave Sheets, the, our, one of our printers back there, he was the printer on it. So he worked together, so we did a group printing on it. Anyway, just give you a little bit of background. So um, there we go. So what created the indie publishing movement was a series of unfortunate or fortunate events. A bunch of stuff happened at once that all created this. So just some background on, on me, I gave you a little bit already, but uh, 2021 has been a typical writing year for me. Um, those are the six books that I've done this year. I know indie authors can do faster than that, but um, Gods and Dragons is a huge epic fantasy, the end of my uh, Spine of the Dragon trilogy. Um, Clockwork Destiny, steampunk adventure, it's the last novel that Neil Peart and I did together. Uh, Persephone, that's a movie I'm working on, and uh, I wrote the novel of it. Um, Nonfiction, Slush Pile Memories, it's a writer's uh, how-to book. Uh, Dune, new Dune novel came out. And Unmasked is an anthology that I put together with my grad students. So that's the books that I head out. And I also write monthly comics for Boom Studios. So we did 12 issues of comics. And there's the Dune graphic novel and a couple of standalone comics. So I've been busy this year. That was my typical year. But things were a little bit different in 1984. There was a fairly well-known writer, you might have heard of him, Stephen King. Stephen King published a book called The Talisman, co-authored with Peter Straub in 1984. Big, fat epic, dark fantasy novel that he wrote. Stephen King is a rather prolific writer. In 1984, 
Stephen King did the unthinkable. He rocked the publishing world and the book selling world. Stephen King published two novels in one calendar year. Only someone as popular as Stephen King could possibly support a readership that would buy two books in a year by the same author. This was headline news in Publishers Weekly. Only Stephen King could write two books in a year. But Stephen King doesn't write two books in a year. He wrote another book, and he had to publish it under Richard Bachman because Stephen King could never publish three books in a year. The readers would revolt, and no one would stand for it. So he published Thinner under a pen name, and it was a pretty closely kept pen name because he didn't want anybody to know he wrote it because then he would be a hack because he wrote three books in one year. But then 14 years ago, almost exactly 14 years ago, November 19th, 2007, the world changed for all of us. And who knows what happened then? Anybody remember what happened then? That thing happened. Amazon released the electronic reader called Kindle. And Amazon, being Amazon, sold them for a cheap enough price that everybody could go, ah, oh, what the heck, I'll buy one. Sorry, I also have a ring doorbell that's telling me a UPS is dropping off probably the books that I meant to sell tomorrow at the signing. Um, anyway, uh, Amazon came out with the Kindle. Now, a little bit before that, I should fill you in. As a science fiction person, as a reader, they had been talking about electronic readers for effing ever. E-readers, e-books are the next big thing. E-readers are going to come out. Um, this one, in March 14, 2000, Wired Magazine did this whole story. I'm going to read it to you because it's, it's important for you to understand because we're back to Stephen King again. And I guess most of you indies didn't realize that Stephen King was a groundbreaker in so much of this stuff. So Stephen King, Stephen King fans will be able to buy the author's latest novella, online. In a move suggesting that ebooks are penetrating the mainstream market, this is 2000, remember, King will be the first major best-selling author to release a book exclusively in electronic format. Publishers hope, hope the milestone will bring exposure to the ebook industry. This has brought huge visibility to the whole category, said Softbook. Anyway, we don't need more of that. But I had one of those. You know what that ebook was? It was a computer floppy diskette. You bought a box that had a computer diskette in it that you put into your five and a quarter inch drive and you called up the letters on your, on your green glowing letters on your Apple IIe screen. And then you just scrolled down and read these really badly formatted texts. That was the first major ebook. Stephen King would sell you a diskette so you could read it on your computer. Yeah, well, it went over. Then in 2002, I had some more direct personal experience with this because, again, everybody had been talking forever. Ebooks are going to be the next big thing. Ebooks are going to be the next big thing. Um, some of you may remember that they were telling us the same thing about video telephones. Since the 1960s, video telephones were going to be the next big thing. And nobody ever, ever, ever used video telephones until Zoom, until um, FaceTime. All that I mean, it took the technology and the penetration in the market to make it work. So it was always like a, authors signed their contracts with publishers. They would have a little clause in there about, yeah, if we ever get around to doing ebooks, we're going to rip you off, but nobody pays attention to things like this. And the, the ebook person at Tor Books called me up and he was ecstatic because Dune, the Butlerian Jihad, in 2002, was their number one best selling ebook for three months running. Month after month, we were the number one ebook. And he was just over the moon. And again, I've been told that all this all along. And I just kind of went, uh, okay, that's exciting. It sounds exciting. How many copies does that mean? 
and he kind of lowered his voice and got this, this tinge of awe in his voice. And, and remember, three months running, and he said, at this date, by now, we've sold over 300 copies. So I went, okay, guess I'm not going to worry about that too terribly much. Um, and I should have. But, but again, in all of my traditional publishing contracts, there was a window of time, probably from like the very early 90s until about the early 2000s, where publishers didn't bother putting ebook rights in their contract because they didn't care about them. Nobody did anything with them. And then after that, they started to go, oh, maybe we should grab these rights in case anything happens. And authors like me were like, but nothing's ever going to happen, so why bother arguing about that clause? So lessons learned. Anyway, 300 copies. So a bunch of these things happened, and I call it a perfect storm because it really was all sorts of things happened to create the thing you're seeing around you all week long in this conference. Like I said before, the Kindle was released. That was a huge difference because Amazon, the way they market things is they'll, they will take a loss on their physical product because they know they're going to get market share on the eBooks. So they were giving away Kindles at way below production costs so that everybody had one. Before that, there was the, the Apple Newton was kind of like the first PDA, very clunky, we had one. Um, there was the Palm Pilot. Uh, my wife had one, and we kind of used them, but they didn't really do anything. It was just sort of like a, my wife is, her religion is gadgetology, and she just wants the new thing, whatever it is. And so she got the Palm Pilot, and she actually downloaded a couple of books that way, and I think I'll get to that in a minute. But anyway, so there were devices out there, but they just didn't catch on. But then when ebooks appear, the traditional publishers, they're freaking out. They don't know what to do with ebooks. They still don't know what to do with ebooks, but they put pricing ridiculously high. They're still ridiculously high, but when I said my wife had a Palm Pilot, there was a um, a comedian who had a weekly show called, his name was Dennis Miller, who has like, completely fallen off the face of the earth now. But he, he was kind of well known that he would, he would, at the end of his show, he would have a rant. And he would rant on some, some topic. And he published a book called Dennis Miller, The Rants. And my wife wanted to read it. And so she bought the Palm Pilot version of it. She paid $28.99 for the ebook version of Dennis Miller's The Rants, which is a really skinny book, on her Palm Pilot. And I remember being really mad at her because I like, you paid $28.99 for an email? And I, in my mind, I'm going, but why would they charge so much? Because there's no printing costs and no shipping costs and no, that, that's a highway robbery. And, and she agreed. I mean, she didn't buy any more of them because it was just ridiculous. P traditional publishers were terrified that if they made ebooks too cheap, people would buy ebooks instead of print books. To which we all go, so? But they didn't think of it that way. They thought that if you bought an ebook, it would cost them a print sale. But they actually make more profit on an ebook than they make on a print book because there's like zero, once you get it loaded up, there's no production costs. But that's not the way their minds think. There's also a terror of pirates. At this time was when Napster was basically raping and pillaging the music industry. Napster was a terrible thing. It was the, if I buy one copy of a song and share it with a million friends, nobody has to pay the, the musician anything. Publishers were terrified that ebooks would be the same thing, that, that one Stephen King fan would buy one Stephen King ebook and share it with a million friends. And at that time, it was actually a legitimate concern. So they responded to that fear by putting on draconian digital rights management stuff onto their files, which, as users, you know, nobody likes DRM. 
And they were just paranoid about getting worse and worse and worse DRM stuff on there so that nobody could break the code and, and, and steal these ebooks. Um, I run this thing called Superstars Writing Seminar in Colorado Springs, and one of our founders is uh, Eric Flint. Eric Flint is a Bain writer, alternate history writer, um, kind of an old curmudgeon guy, and he's got his opinions, and I, I love him to death. And Eric was invited, and Eric's not Mr. Tech Savvy at all. He was invited to this Microsoft conference where they were showing off their new absolutely unbreakable digital rights management, and they wanted Eric to be proud of how great and how protected his books were going to be. And Eric, who is not a tech guy, kind of looked at it and listened to them and, and said, you can do all that if you want, but I can break your DRM in 10 minutes. And they just looked, no, you can't. We've got it unbreakable. And he said, I can get a digital copy of that book in, in no matter what DRM you put on it. And they, they were talking, and how do you do this? And he said, I get a print copy, I run it through a scanner, and I've got an ebook file, and I put it up there for free, if that's what I'm trying to do. And then they all kind of went away muttering and stuff. So there is no... DRM, conceptually, yes, you want to put a lock on your door. But if you drive everybody away, you're not going to have any customers. Anyway, the other thing that was making publishers go crazy is with an ebook, readers can have multiple copies of the same book at the same time in different places. When I was a kid, I bought a paperback copy of Frank Herbert's Dune for 75 cents at a, at a B. Dalton bookseller. And I read it until it fell apart, and then I liked it, so I went out and bought another paperback copy of it. And then I bought another paperback copy of it. And when I started working in the Dune universe, I needed to have all kinds of copies to use yellow highlighter on and all these things. So all these copies, every time I bought one, Frank Herbert got his share of royalties. Well, now you buy one ebook and you can put it on your laptop, on your phone, on your Kindle, on your iPad, on everything. So you can have 30 different copies of this book in different places, and the author of that book got paid once. That's a complete change of mindset. Okay, here's some more stuff in the outside world. Events that happen to create the indie publishing movement. Book distributors. Um, Anderson News was one of the biggest ones. These were the people that would take regularly published traditional books from warehouses and put them on Safeway book racks and airport book racks and train station book racks and drugstore book racks and 7-Eleven book racks and all these, they would put books everywhere. They all went out of business. Most of them went out of business. Anderson News, 2009, 2010, and start doing the math. This is all the same year that Amazon comes out with the Kindle and, and other things are happening. Borders Books, one of the two largest bookstore chains in the United States. It's not half of the book sales, but it's pretty darn near half of the book sales for us. Went away. Vanished. Went bankrupt in 2011. And for those of us who are genre fiction writers like me, it wasn't just one of the two major bookstore chains went out of business. Barnes & Noble and Borders were the two big kahunas, right? Borders was the genre fiction bookstore. Barnes & Noble was the literary fiction bookstore. I mean, not entirely, but, but Borders leaned more heavily on genre, so genre writers got a much harder kick when Borders closed. So all these bookstores went out of business, and us authors, our outlet went away, and a bunch of books, book sales went away. Again, 2011, Anderson News went out of business 2010. Kindle comes out at about the same time. When I was a new author, my first novel was published in 1988. 
and I had a literary agent, and I wrote a lot, and we would send these books around. When my agent started, there were 12 to 14 major publishers he could send one of my books to. I'd take out a manuscript, and he would send it to all these different places, and I had all these options that might buy my book. And if the best case scenario happened, then you had three or four publishers who wanted the same book, and they would fight over it and then uh, do an auction and drive up the price. Well, all of those publishers started Pac-Man games and gobbling each other up and buying and, and consolidating so that they were now down to the big five publishers. Simon & Schuster, Hachette, Macmillan, um, Penguin Random House, and HarperCollins. Oops, sorry. Big four per commercial publishers because Penguin Random House is gobbling up Simon & Schuster. Except last week, um, uh, Department of Commerce has just blocked that sale because there aren't enough publishers out there and they're afraid that the big four will have a monopoly. And I have real mixed feelings about this because, um, hello, there's options for all of us to publish everything everywhere. It's not like a, a monopoly means you can't go anywhere else. And there's plenty of other places to go. But anyway, um, as of 2020, that was what was happening. The, what, what I started out with 12 to 14 publishers to go to is now down to the big four. So all this is going on when the mass market, the little, the smaller paperbacks, not the trade paperbacks, the smaller mass market paperbacks, that market just imploded. Mass market paperbacks was where all of us genre fiction people made our bread and butter. Those were the mid-list science fiction books. Those were the, the media tie-in books. Those were the movie novelization books. Those were the westerns, the Harlequin romances, all of those things. That share of the market just collapsed. <coughs> all of the media tie-in work went away. In the 90s, that was, that was my career. Was I, I did I, I had one year where I had seven New York Times bestsellers in the same year. I was writing Star Wars books and X Files books and Star Trek books and and once you got plugged into that, you could pick up the phone and say, "Hey, I've got a month free. Can you give me a Star Trek book?" And they'd pay you fifteen thousand dollars for it, and you'd write a Star Trek book because I was a Star Trek fan, and that was just do a Star Trek adventure, and they were only sixty thousand words, and you could get it done. At the same time, there were movie tie-in paperbacks. Almost every movie that hit the theaters, they paid some author to write a paperback version of that movie so that you could, and you would get paid $10,000 to take a movie script and write, he said, she said, well, that's more complicated than that, but, but it was steady work, and you, you paid all your bills by doing stuff like that. As all of that stuff was going away, the publishers who used to be very liberal with their advances. They used to be, like, they would pay you a lot of money for your book advances. Well, 20000 became the new 200000 Advances just dropped by 90% across the board. And it's no easier to write a book for $20,000 than for $200,000, but that's all they decided to pay. And all this stuff together made for really tough times for the authors who were just doing this and making a living at it. But on the brighter side, because with COVID, we learned to look at silver linings and everything. So here's the silver lining. All this bad stuff was happening, but established authors like myself, we had a ton of backlist titles because I've been writing book after book after book after book, and they'd get published and they'd go out of print and what happened back then was nobody paid attention to your, your mid-list backlist, like your average science fiction book that came out, did its thing, and then it went out of the bookstores, and nobody ever wanted to reprint those. It wasn't cost-effective because they had to do it the traditional way and print 10,000 copies at a time and ship them out to bookstores. So I, Kevin, had like 30 books that I had written that I had all the rights back to, and they were just sitting there. And, the only, and at this point, 
my fan base was really building up. I was selling millions of copies of my Star Wars books, and though some of those fans thought, I want to read Kevin's first novel. Well, it's out of print. They can't find it anywhere. And so they're buying them in used bookstores, which is great for them, but I don't get anything out of people buying a copy in a used bookstore. So all of this stuff is just like circling around. They're like, they're like sharks circling around. Amazon started Kindle Direct Publishing in 2007, and they said, hey, authors, you can do it yourself. This is one of these left field things here that it wasn't until after all this stuff came together I realized, whoa, that was another big domino that fell. At the same time, all these stock art services started showing up. Shutterstock, Dreamstime, Adobe Stock, all these places putting up all this artwork that was really good art that you didn't really have to pay anything for. There are millions of images virtually free so that you could actually make a neat book cover with a dragon and a castle on it for your fantasy and it looked like this great cover artist painted it and you don't have to pay anything for it. There, you, I'm sure you're all familiar with Shutterstock and Dreams Time and all the, all the basic things. So these stock art services were a boon for us indie authors that wanted to make covers. It was devastating for cover artists. My cover artist, Stephen Ewell, who does, uh, he did uh, my Hellhole covers, a bunch of my Star Wars covers, all of the Dune covers. Stephen Ewell is a Hugo Award-winning artist. Um, he did Sisterhood of Dune, the, the one on the left there. Stephen was one of the most in-demand cover artists in the industry. He regularly got paid three to four thousand dollars to do a cover painting for a book. The Sisterhood of Dune there, he got paid, I don't know exactly, but he got paid about that to do that cover painting. The other Sisterhood of Dune is the Simon & Schuster British edition of it. So they sent us the, the painted one on the left, uh, uh, Tor Books did, and we approved that. And then Simon & Schuster sent us the UK cover for the one on the right. They said, here's our cover for Sisterhood of Dune. And it's a perfectly nice cover. But we said, so it's a spaceship landing on an ice planet. What does that have to do with Dune? Oh, well, it just, oh, we test marketed it and everybody loves it. And we kind of said, but that isn't in the story anywhere and there's no ice planet and there's no, then what kind of ship is that? And they said, but it test marketed well, it'll sell great. And we just kind of did the, oh, whatever, sure. Well, later when I'm doing Wordfire press covers and I've got a space opera and I'm looking up something with an image for a spaceship on an ice planet, guess what? That's a freebie stock art image that Simon & Schuster used for the cover of a Dune book. Because they were saving $4,000 too. Then, just as indie publishing becomes more and more viable for writers, that we actually have an alternative to do this, you would think traditional publishers would realize, whoa, we better be nicer to our authors and keep them. Well, as a reactionary thing, they started putting the most monstrous things in their contracts that would scare you running into the, into the night. And I'm, do we have, yeah, we've got time. I'm going to actually go over this so that you can see just how awfully insidious this is. This is from a writer friend of mine who got a contract from a major Big Five publisher for three books, uh, Young Adult Fantasy Adventures. And they paid him okay, I think 20000 a book, so it's okay that they, that's a decent advance. So he, saw, he's, he sends me this contract. Is this a good contract? And then I read this. And this is in the non-compete clause, just to give you some background. Author shall not publish a competing work for a period of six months prior to publisher's initial publication of the work and for a period of six months after publisher's initial publication of work, the non-competition period. A competing work shall be, read that, any book-length work, novel, novella, collection of stories, 
of adult fiction. Basically, that top paragraph says, for an entire six months before and six months after, a whole year around when this book is published, he cannot publish a word other than this one book that they paid $20,000 for. I don't know about you, but I kind of need to earn more than $20,000 in a year to make a living. Now, that was this exclusion period. The second paragraph, this the work, meaning the next book in this fantasy trilogy, the work will be the author's next book-length work. Author represents that author is not subject to any commitment for initial publication by a third party of another book-length work, written or co-written. So he can't agree to write anything at all, even if Stephen King wants to write with him. Author will not offer rights to another book-length work, written or co-written. So if Stephen King wants to collaborate with him, he can't even offer that contract or accept an offer for such a work until acceptance and until author has complied with the option. In other words, until he is freaking done with this three-book contract and it's a year after they publish it, he can't sell anything else. In any event, author will not permit the publication until 12 months after the publisher's first publication of the work. And if a publisher takes a year to publish a book, which is what they usually do, and he's got a trilogy, and he's got to write them, so it's a year for him to write the first one, because that's when they want it, and then three-year period for them to publish the three books, and then a year after that, five years to the day from when he signs this contract, he is not allowed to publish anything. That sucks. And any author who sees this and says, yay, I want to be with a traditional publisher, that's, this just really makes me angry because there is no need for that. Utterly no need for that. But because they're, they're scared, they want to grab all these rights. And it's just literally not fair. And, and yes, we got all this stuff struck out of his contract. So, not, so it's just sort of like, let's throw it up there and see what we can do. Anyway, enough of my ranting. As you can tell, I'm interested in the subject. So I'm going to give you some background. So I was looking at this. This is 2009, 2010. I was seeing all these changes coming. It was looking like, like um, you know, Godzilla's coming this direction and King Kong's coming that direction. And I was watching that, or actually a more appropriate thing, I was like looking up in the sky and going, there's a giant asteroid coming toward us. Isn't that pretty? So by sheer luck, well, I mean by sheer good business acumen, I signed three major three-book contracts in that year because I'm a prolific author and I like to sign multiple book contracts because to me that's job security. This is in traditional days. And this is like, this is like the high point of when they were still paying really big advances. I was um, uh, doing really well. I had a whole bunch of bestsellers at, at that, that point. So I was able to get these three really significant multiple book contracts. Um, I had a fantasy trilogy called Terra Incognita, uh, Orbit Books. They paid me $375,000 for that trilogy. And because this is 20 books, yes, I'm being honest and telling you what real numbers are. Brian Herbert and I also did our own original science fiction contract uh, for a trilogy called Hellhole with Tor. And, and um, we made $600,000 for that, and we split it, so three hundred dollars each. And then we did a three-book contract for a new Dune trilogy, which, um, again, that's split with me and Brian in the Herbert estate, so it's not, uh, it's all broken up into pieces. And all these payments are, are on, you know, delivery of the outline and final manuscript and on publication and hardcover. So it, that's a lot of money right there, but they didn't give me a check for all that money. They gave it to me in pieces over a long period of time. But what that meant for me was that I now had something like a five-year guaranteed safety net, that I had job security, I knew what I was doing, and I basically had the elbow room to figure out 
how I was going to survive this asteroid that was coming toward us. Because I could see it, and I wanted to do something about it so that I wasn't five years from now going, oh, I should have seen this. What did I do? So it's quick and easy. Let's make lots of money. Let's form our own publishing house. So in about 2010, we formed Wordfire Press. Um, we, could, we just could do it ourselves. Now, there's actually a good background and reason for this because uh, my wife, Rebecca, and I, we both spent disaster in publishing, I guess. We just spent, we had spent our careers working in publishing. We were editors, we were publishers, we, we were graphic designers. We already, we were professional editors. We knew how to do the, the cover art. We knew how to do the interior book design. We knew about fonts, we knew about layout, we knew all that stuff. And so we had the skills. And as Wordfire Press, well, hello, I'm Kevin J. Anderson, and I had 30 books that were out of print, and they just needed to be reprinted. So I already had, I had a bunch of books that I could publish. So we were ready to go. We could start up this company, and we could go on it. And I really should have stopped there. This is just kind of my, my warning thing for you guys if you're thinking of starting up a publishing house. But I also had a whole bunch of backlist from, from a bunch of my friends because they could kind of sort of see that something was coming and these ebook things might be worthwhile and publishing is changing, but they didn't want to learn how to do all this stuff. So, hey, Kevin, why don't you publish our stuff? And I thought, how hard can that be? So I got Frank Herbert's backlist. I got Mike Resnick's backlist. I got Jody Lynn Nye's backlist. I got um, Alan Drury, who wrote Advise and Consent, a bunch of great political novels. I got those books. Um, I got Brian Herbert's backlist. Um, all these people are like, oh, Kevin can do this. And so I got a bunch of uh, my backlist from, a backlist from my friends. And then once you start doing that, you go, hey, I should get like every backlist that I can come up with. And I've worked in the field all my career. I know all of these authors. So then I started going after, um, hey, do you have any backlist that you want to get uh, back in print? And just give it to me and I'll split the earnings 50-50. And I had a lot of friends and a lot of people gave me their backlist. And it was this gold rush. And in fact, there were... Um, how many of you know Open Road? Have you heard of Open Road? Um, Open Road was uh, worked uh, Betsy Mitchell, who was my Star Wars editor at Bantam Books. She also knew everybody in the business, and it was sort of like this this gold <coughs> gold rush of Betsy Mitchell and Open Road, and they were all running around to all these classic science fiction authors, saying, "Give me your backlist," and and it was a race for to see who could grab which ones. At the time. I don't know if all of you know what the long tail is, but it's a, it's a real philosophy of, if you think of a, of a sales curve, a company that has a whole bunch of different items, the sales curve is like, there's this big peak of all the super best sellers right up at the front, and then it tapers off the ones that sort of sell middling, and then if you have a really big library, then there's this long, long, long tail that's just kind of a skinny tail that goes on forever and ever of your, your million titles that sell a couple of copies. Well, the area under that long tail part of the curve actually adds up to a lot of money. And music industries discovered this, that if they, yeah, they have their gigantic gold record hits, but if they have a lot of songs in their library that are only selling one or two copies, it makes money. So in the philosophy of the, lo philosophy of the long tail, we started doing, like, let's just get any kind of book, and we would grab everything we possibly could and just start publishing it and throwing it up there. Well, the problem with that is then you have to do royalties and accounting, which is like a, a nightmare and a half. And my wife keeps quoting back to me, you said, how hard could it be? And it, that's actually the biggest nightmare when you do all of these books by all of these authors. And we're wide. We're not exclusive. So that means I get 38 statements for every title every month. There's a lot of digesting of numbers, so, so beware. I want you to understand the truly, truly massive financial shift between being a traditional writer and being an indie writer. 
As a traditional writer, I got paid money up front, and I wrote the book, and the publisher did all the work, the publisher sold them, and it earned royalties, and I might or might not in some number of years get a check because it's made the advance back. Um, this is actually worth explaining a little bit. So an advance against royalties, which is how traditional publishing works, is they would pay the author, say, $10,000. That's your advance. They give you the $10,000 because you need to, like, eat and pay the rent while you're writing the book for them. That $10,000 is just what it says, an advance against royalties. So when they publish your, your book, say you get 12% royalties. 12% royalties times a $5 book, which they aren't going to be $5. That means $0.60 cents a book, if I did my math right. You have to sell enough copies of that book, earning $0.60 cents per copy, to add up to $10,000 to pay your loan back before you start making any money. That's an advance against royalties. That's how traditional publishing works. Most of the time, you never earn your loan back. So you don't make any more money other than what they paid you up front. So you want to get the most up front that you possibly can. You get the money, net present value of cash, you live on that money. So like I showed you those, those trilogies that I had sold, the 300000 for this and 200000 that was money that they were giving me so I could pay my expenses while I wrote those books. In any publishing, you have to pay all the expenses up front. You don't get any money up front. you got to shell out up front. And then you start earning royalties once you start selling them. But in trad, I got money from the get-go. And shifting from getting money up front model to a pay all your expenses up front model is a pretty significant difference. How do you transition from that? Well, my big crusade that I've been doing for years now for all indie authors, for all traditional authors, is the only way you're really going to survive is if you have multiple income streams. I used to be able to write books, make a living. Write another book, make another living. That's all I did. Well, I still do traditional publishing advances. I still sell Dune books to Tor. I still sell graphic novels to Abrams. They pay me up front. I write the book. They publish them. They do all the work. And I still get, get paid. I write a bunch of freelance articles or short stories. If um, Dean Kuntz has a horror anthology, he says, Kevin, write me a short story. So I'll write a short story and he'll pay me $500 and that's how I get paid. I'll write an article for Writer's Digest and they'll pay me for that. Um, I used to do, well, I'm still doing a lot of little freelance pieces like that. I'm Wordfire Press. I'm a publisher. We get 50% of the income for all these books that are being, being published. Um, I have a couple more minutes still beyond that, don't I? All right, well, I'm going to go real fast then. So as the publisher, I get income as the publisher because I get 50% of all the stuff. But I'm also Kevin Anderson, the author that happens to be published by Wordfire Press. So I get my author share of the royalties. Before COVID, at least, I was doing a lot of paid speaking gigs. I would go to some conference and they'd pay me to give a talk on something. I, I, would, I got paid $5,000 to go to a banking conference to talk about the future of money. That's a cool gig. And I started doing a lot of that. And then this pandemic thing kind of shut it down. Um, my wife does a whole lot of freelance editing. She charges per page to do editing. And we made income that way. I'm a college professor, as I mentioned. The cards are up here, so I'm trying to get you to sign up for my master's class. Um, I get paid a salary as a college professor, but I also get health benefits as a college professor, which is really, really important. I do book sales. We have an online bookstore. I sell autographed copies of my books. I go to conventions. I have a table. I sell copies of my books. Tomorrow, I'm doing I'm a table at the book signing here. I will sell books. I make money when I sell those books. So that's another income stream. And this is the unicorn. There is film and TV money. 
option money, um, shopping agreement money, script money, all that kind of stuff. That is possibly the biggest amount of money, but it's also the most uncertain amount of money. So if it comes in, hooray, but don't ever budget based on film or TV. Um, I might just need to stop here. I'll just kind of roll through that. There's There are reasons to still go with traditional publishing, um, and I can, are we okay or not? All right, because I've got, I've got like 10 more to roll right through if there's nothing else. Um, so there's reasons. I mean, a lot of my indie authors are desperate to be published by a trad publisher because it's respectable, that they want to see their books in a Barnes & Noble. Um, I like the fact that they do some really, really tough editing and I don't have to pay for it. I like the fact that they do really good cover designs and I don't have to pay for it. So, you know, and that they distribute to bookstores. I'm going to do a really, really fast one here because this is just an example. This is my... Uh, Trad, big, huge, epic fantasy trilogy, Wake the Dragon. Spine of the Dragon is the first one. It's sort of like Game of Thrones, but finished. Um, so here's the timeline on this one. So I'm, I'm like, what's my next project? I'm going to write this big, epic fantasy trilogy, and I've got this idea for it. I'm going to outline it and sell it. So on January 2017 is when I thought... Um, all right, I'm going to start this. So I sit down and I start doing my, you know, the outline and the character development and all that. And because this is traditional, I'm going with my agent. He's going to send it around to other publishers. I need to write up a proposal, sample chapters, and a pitch. It's like you selling it ahead of time. So I wrote up my, my um, first, I did the first 100 pages of the book. I wrote this whole, like, sales pitch I also got, because I happen to like know people, I got gushing blurbs from these huge authors, Terry Goodkind, Sherilyn Kenyon, uh, Robin Hobb, Brandon Sanderson, Ari Salvatore. They all said that Kevin Anderson's Spine of the Dragon is the best book that's ever been written in the history of mankind. Um, and so my agent takes out this proposal and sends it around to all these publishers and say, who wants to buy it? We're having an auction. <coughs> So we had other publishers look at it, and they're expressing interests, and, um, and they make their offers. And on Oct in October 2017, this is how slow it goes, October is when we accepted the offer from Tor Books. So that's already 10 months after I decided to write it, or to write the proposal, I made a deal. So that's October. I don't see the contracts until January, and there are things wrong with it that those ugly clauses were not in my contract, but there were bad ones too. In, in March of 2018, so by now it's 14 months after I started this, that's when I signed the contracts. And then in May of 2018 is when I delivered the final manuscript to Spine of the Dragon to the editor who's been working with me all along, who bought the book for Tor. He said, we should buy this turn in the final manuscript, and then the editor quit. So then another editor comes on who knows nothing about this book at all. And then she needs to read it and come back with her feedback because her opinion is different from the other editors. And I do some more rewriting of it. And I got revision requests from her in July, which is frankly fairly quick to turn around a 200,000-word book. And then I rewrote like crazy. And then in September of 2018, I delivered the final manuscript. In November, they gave me the typeset galleys, which I had to prove. Then in December, they sent out the review copies. And finally, in June of 2019, from January of 2017, June of 2019 is when the book was published. Now, let me remind you, this is what I wrote this year alone. So um, if it takes two to three years for a traditional publisher to publish a book and one to two years to, oh, oh, well, the, the other thing I didn't say is like I'm, I have an agent who, and I'm dealing with publishers who know me. So when a Kevin Anderson book comes in, they'll read it. If you're a new author and you're just sending in a manuscript, it can be two to three years before you even get a response. And after that, say it's best case scenario, you sell your thing, 
After that, another one to two years before the book actually hits the shelves. So what do you do when you write three books a year or ten books a year or whatever? That's, a no, that's why people do indie publishing. You just can't wait that long. So what do you do? Just I'm going to leave you with one last little bit of warning because you'll get some of this around here. I'm lowering my voice so nobody hears us, but some of this around here at the 20 Books Conference, don't get cocky because all I showed you is this whole rise and fall of traditional publishing. You are still in a very new business, a very new industry. There are constant disruptions happening. You may well be in for a disastrous fall because something changes. Don't get cocky, pay attention, and know your history, and uh, keep writing. So there you go. Thanks, everybody.